David and Jerry Pincus truly had a lifetime of collecting. Many collectors find art as a couple, as they grow, as, as they mature. But with David and Jerry, it literally started on their honeymoon. Um, David had been collecting for several years prior to meeting Jerry. They arrived in Rome, staying at the Villa Medici, the Hassler Villa Medici. And who does Jerry see but Henry Moore having tea? She was extremely excited because an artist that she knew that David was very interested in acquiring at some point. So she asked the concierge to slip a note to Mr. Moore to his room to see if they might be have a chance to say hello. And in fact, Mr. Henry Moore called their room the next morning and he invited them to breakfast. And so a lifelong friendship with Henry Moore and a truly a partnership in collecting began at that time. David was certainly one of the driving forces in the collecting, but it was something they did together, traveling far and wide, visiting galleries, and getting to know the artists. Four years later, in 1965, Andy Warhol had his first museum exhibition ever in the United States. It was held at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia. David had helped found the museum with Mrs. H. Gates, also known as Lolly Lloyd. At that time, David and Jerry bought a fantastic, very, very tough picture, but beautiful, 20 Jackies. This was in the wake of the Kennedy assassination, and I think everyone in their generation felt that impact, as well as eight elect little electric chairs, which were, again were very tough images. We have incredible photographs of David and Jerry at Mrs. Lloyd's house with Edie Sedgwick, Andy Warhol, Samuel Adams Green, who was the director of the museum, Leo Castelli and Ethel Skull. They had a very keen sense of building a collection with great, great art and the, the names of the time. A work which truly helped define the collection, especially in terms of the post-war, American post-war artists, is the Mark Rothko entitled 1961. This is a painting they acquired in 1967. The Rothko became the first major acquisition of an abstract expressionist artist, and they chose the best. They did wait until they found the Rothko they felt was the most beautiful, the most powerful, and the highest quality. After the Rothko, they added other works from the New York School. Orange, Red, Yellow is probably one of the most important Rothko paintings to ever appear at auction. This is a painting that is really one of Rothko's most exuberant. Red is a color that fascinated him throughout his career. It's a color that was, really dominates many of his most important canvases. Orange, Red, Yellow was painted in a very particularly fertile period in 1961 between some of the Great Lake paintings of 1958 including the Seagram's and Harvard murals, which was a key moment for him in terms of scale as well as palette. It's a remarkable painting because we, all, we know that Rothko very much liked to see his works in natural light. He didn't like artificial light in his studio. And we've seen this painting in daylight, in dusk, in artificial light, and it changes at every given moment. There's this fantastic red, these beautiful bursts of orange layered with yellow and other orange pigments. Then there is at the very top, this wonderful sort of bronze ochre cloud. It's not a color one necessarily knows, but it is a perfect kind of counterpoint to the, the blast of color that you see hovering below. It's a very sophisticated picture in that way. It's a balance of almost conceptual as well as ethereal beauty. The Pincus collection also includes an extraordinary group of Willem de Kooning's late work. This includes two paintings, one from 1980 and one from 1983, as well as four bronze sculptures from between 69 and 72. We see the same properties in the bronze sculptures as we do the painting, the sense of tactile surfaces, the ever-presence of a, the woman figure, however disguised by gesture and brushstroke. One painting, Untitled Five, from 1983, was just recently exhibited in the highly regarded Museum of Modern Art retrospective curated by John Elderfield. It was one of only a few canvases from his late period represented. The sweeping gestures of white, red, and blue, and yellow. The red becomes a very beautiful, almost coral color as it's been mixed with white. The line is there. You sense his great joy of paint. It's a fantastic picture. Entitled One, from 1980, is one of the first works to emerge after de Kooning's absence from painting in the late 70s painted with broad but well-constructed brushstrokes of greens, blues, whites, violets, and even a bit of orange. It weaves itself together like a sculpture. You see how physical these pictures were. He uses a palette knife along with other instruments to scrape the surface in broad strokes. So you have this wonderful translucency layered with lots of paint. 
seeing together in this fantastic installation at the Museum of Modern Art, we saw this forest of de Kooning sculptures, which reminded one of seeing Giacometti's in the Giacometti Museum. And we are very fortunate with this group from Pincus to have that same depth of representation where you can really examine the great genius, the tactile nature, the physicality, and the interest that de Kooning brought to the third dimension. Jackson Pollock's entitled 1951 was acquired by the Pincuses in the late 60s, shortly after they acquired the Rothko. They had looked for a Pollock on canvas for several years as well. They were able to acquire this work, which came from a famed Chicago collection, the Arnold H. Merrimont collection at that time. Entitled 1951 was painted soon after Pollock had completed his series of black enamel paintings. These were paintings that were unstretched cotton duck in which he poured black enamel in deep pools and configurations that sometimes suggested a figure. They really take the all over drip and magnify it to a level not yet seen in his pictures. It's interesting to look at the reverse of Untitled 1951 because you see the base of the painting is actually poured enamel pools in large black swirls. Pollock then continued to work the surface with silvery gray paint, white, blue, red, and yellow. And overpourings of white enamel create a picture with great depth and constant action. Untitled 1951 measures 30 by 54 inches. It's the largest Pollock canvas to come to auction in nearly 25, 30 years. One of the most important works of the Pingus collection is the Barnett Newman painting, One Month Five. It's a rare and iconic work. There are very few Barnett Newmans remaining in private hands. One Month Five is from a series of six paintings of the same title. All but one are in museums. While his contemporaries were actively involved in painting with color, gesture, and action, Newman was looking for something else. He began to pare his painting down to elements of simply color and line. Around this period, blue was a color that preoccupied Newman. He was also experimenting with paint application, creating a very saturated and deep blue surface using the combination of brush strokes and spray guns so that there are deep pools of color and depth, creating another dimension to a, an already iconic work. Dave and Jerry's lives were also defined by the extraordinary philanthropy. And not only philanthropy with art, they gave numerous things to museums over the years, as well, but as well as humanitarian causes, particularly children in need. While many collectors wait till a certain point in their life to, to give art to institutions, Dave and Jerry gave throughout their lifetimes. Uh, very early on, four Jackies and two electric chairs entered the collection of the Philadelphia Art Museum, as well as an important and defining sculpture by Marc de Suvero which they acquired in 1964, right after his first show at the Jewish Museum. One of the great gifts to the Philadelphia Art Museum was Clay Soldenberg's three-way plug, Type A, which was given in honor of the late Anne Darnancourt, who was an inspiration as well as a friend to, to David and Jerry. One of the longest and most enduring relationships David and Jerry had with an artist was with the artist Mark de Suvero. They met Mark in 1964, that's when they acquired their first work, and over the years, continued to have a friendship that was not only as artist and patron, but also as friend and supporter. There is a great friendship that happened because he was a great spirit. He had something else. It was that he had a giving spirit that was so wonderful. Uh, what he did in Africa and Israel and with artists was of a level that uh, very few people achieve. And it was that there was this huge empathy in him. He loved life. David very much believed that art should be for everyone to enjoy. And one of his great passions was the Fairmont Park Art Association in Philadelphia. He was served on the board for over 30 years, gave several works to Fairmont Park. One of the most extraordinary and impressive was Marc de Suvero's Iroquois, soaring 30-foot high scul red sculpture, which stands proudly in the center of this park. The same passion that Jerry and David shared for art and for collecting was extended into their many, many, many philanthropical endeavors. David was extremely moved in the early 80s during the humanitarian crisis in Africa and made a trip to Ethiopia, and what he saw was devastating. And he felt from that point on that it's something that he would commit his life to. He made numerous trips to Sub-Saharan Africa, to South Africa, Philippines, Bangladesh, Kosovo, Mostar, war-torn countries, and places of crisis. Um, often accompanied by his great friend, Elie Wiesel, 
to mature the refugee camps and work with teams both at CARE and your National Rescue Committee to help further the cause of bringing aid and relief to these people in need. But children were his first and foremost concern, and he felt that even for those who were, didn't stand a chance of survival, he wanted them to have a moment of joy, a moment of happiness. I met David about 25 years ago. I was a budding pediatrician, uh, becoming a pediatric aid specialist, and I was sent to him because he queried uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia about He'd read an article in the Wall Street Journal about homeless children with, with AIDS. He was uh, uh, an extraordinary individual. I'd never really met anybody like him. The energy, the uh, just sort of the, uh, uh, the, the, the sunrise, really, that came out of his smile and his eyes. One day, uh, we went to 21 Club, and over a martini, he looked across at me with those basset hound eyes of his. And he said, you know, you're on the verge of eradicating pediatric AIDS in Harlem. Don't you think it's now time to start doing something internationally? And I'd really never thought about it. Uh, but I mulled it over, and that one suggestion then led to the creation of uh, our International Family AIDS program at Columbia University. It's now worked mostly in the Dominican Republic, but also Haiti, South Africa, and Russia. He found a character that spoke to him and became a portable object of joy. So on his 70th birthday, his daughter, Leslie, uh, bought him this Snoopy suit. So who shows up at Incarnation that day but David in his Snoopy suit? And uh, it, was a, it was a funny scene because he went around and did what he always does when he goes around to see children. He handed out little Snoopies, lollipops. The excitement of the Pincus collection is that David and Jerry continued to collect the art of their time. They were certainly visionary when they acquired Andy Warhol's work in 1965 and continued to add masters by the New York School throughout the 60s and early 70s. David was very much affected by the world around him. Representing the collection is an extremely important group of photographers. Many emerged in the 70s and 80s, which addressed themes of AIDS, war, gender, and the way the world was changing. In works by Cindy Sherman, Nan Golden, and particularly Jeff Wall's Tour de Force, David and Jerry moved from one generation to another effortlessly and with great insight and purpose. This extraordinary collection represents an amazing journey taken by Jerry and David.